I am so excited to announce that iDriver Classic is now sponsored by Adrian Flux, one of the UK's leading classic car insurers. If you're looking for classic car insurance, I've popped a link to Adrian Flux in the description box below. Hi guys, it's Steph from iDriver Classic, or if you're watching from Russia, I should probably say Vivyad, which apparently is hello. Um, in today's video, we're gonna be looking at this fantastic Lada Riva from 1993. We've got a 1.5 under the bonnet, we're on a five speed manual box on this, and we're gonna take it out for a test drive. It's a really nice example with a few optional extras, and I'm gonna introduce you to Russia's most popular second-hand car. And the best thing about it is, is you can put it on classic insurance, you've got full parts availability, and it's cheap to buy. So for all of you at home that keep asking me which starter classic you should go for, well, we're going to take a look at the Lada Riva. We've never had a Lada on iDrive Classic before, so this is something a bit different and exciting. Now, if you're watching this from the UK, you'll know this car as the Lada Riva. But if you're watching from abroad, you may know it as the Lada Kalinka, the Lada Leica, the Dennis Signet, or even the VAZ or VAZ 2105. Now, as the car progressed through its life cycle, it became known as the Lada Classic. So I guess for everyone moaning that this isn't a classic, it technically is. Now, before VAZ launched the Riva, it launched the 2101 which was the first car they'd ever brought to market. And like a lot of budding car manufacturers, they looked at others in the market for a car they could essentially jazz up and rebadge for their appropriate target audience, which is where Fiat came in. So the 124 had won the European Car of the Year in 1967, and Vaz worked with Fiat under license and adapted the 124 to fit the needs of the Russian driver. The new car, the 2101, was given upgrades, including aluminium brakes to rear, a suspension which could withstand Russian terrain, a body made of heavier steel, and reinforced chassis in key stress points. So they put it through a test and they found that it cracked in certain areas. So they said, right, let's essentially beef those areas up. And they also had a new engine designed by NAMI, which sported an overhead camshaft design which hadn't been used by Fiat. However, if you're watching in Italy and you've never seen this car, it's probably no surprise because part of the agreement was, was that Vaz would never sell these Ladas in Italy to protect Fiat sales. So how does this all relate to the Fiat we're testing today? Well, on the back of the runaway success of the 2101, the Riva we are testing here today was launched, and for most parts, there aren't an enormous amount of differences. There were a few updates, including a revamp of the 1.3 engine and the overhead camshaft design, which was once driven by train, now being driven by toothed belt drive. But things like the aluminium alloy drum brakes, which could be a bit of a pain when warm and ended up being a bit of ineffective, stayed firmly on the car. Now, the only other significant update was a change in the 90s to a single point fuel injection and catalytic converter. Now, you might be thinking, well, that's very forward thinking and keeping up with other manufacturers, finally. But it was actually simply done as a box ticking exercise to meet emissions legislation. Now, I know that you're probably sat at home thinking, this is ridiculous that a car so basic was selling so well and even coming to market in 1980. But consider the home audience and it starts to make a bit more sense. So the car at launch in 1980 was born into that weird cold world era where the average Russian was having to wait over a year for a new car. So buyers were at a point where simply owning a car was a massive privilege. So buyers just weren't choosy like they were over here and they weren't sport for choice. And if you're wondering why they didn't go for a second hand car, because of the wait for cars and because having a car was such a privilege, people just didn't get rid of cars. And sometimes a second hand car could cost more than a brand new one, which is madness. Now, interestingly, despite the fact that it was a bit bog standard basic, this Lada wasn't only popular in Russian, 
And in fact, over 18 million Lada Reavers were sold across the world. And they were sold everywhere from the home territory of Russia, to the UK, to Egypt, and even over to New Zealand. And in fact, it's worth mentioning the deal with New Zealand because it's actually a little bit weird. So the cars were sold and distributed by the New Zealand Dairy Board and were weirdly swapped with Soviet Russia for deliveries of mutton and butter. So they didn't actually pay for the cars, they were just swapping them for essentially meat and dairy. And you might think this was a deal that was a one-time thing, but it actually went on all the way through to 1990. Now, when the car came to market in 1983 in the UK, you could have picked a 1300GL or the Reva 1200L. And in the UK, the car did relatively well, even though it was so basic. So by 1986, they'd sold 20,000. And those sales continued because by 1988, they'd sold 30,000, which actually was quite a lot. Now, the cars, wherever you bought them globally, were only ever available with a four or five speed manual box. However, there are lots of different variants across the world in terms of how these cars came to market, which really proves the versatility of the car, but also leaves me in a position today where I simply cannot run through every single variant because I could probably sit here for hours and tell you because they really did, although they were a basic car, they really did slightly tweak them for different markets, which is probably why they were so popular. Now, despite cheap car competition coming in from various other manufacturers across the world, which I do talk about later in the video, the Reva continued to sell, albeit slower as the 90s progressed, because other cheap car options came to the market. Because when this came to the UK for sale, it was incredibly cheap. In fact, I think it was only around £3,300, which is roughly £10,000 in today's money. So it was a cheap car. Now, the only reason that they stopped selling these cars in the UK in 2007 was down to emissions. And they decided to withdraw rather than modify the cars, which could be in part due to the fact that they weren't selling as well as they could have done. Now, the Reva was possibly one of the world's most loved cars and only ceased production in April 2011. And they still look like this, by the way. And the estate variant stopped being sold in Egypt in 2015, which is insane, but also means that you can still get the parts. Now that we've talked about this car a little bit, I wanted to introduce the owner, Steve, with the caveat that I do know that the number plates shouldn't be black and white, but remember, it's not my car to mess around with, and I have advised that, and the plates are visible for both the video and for filming. Hi, I'm Steve. This is my Lada. Um, it's on an L plate. I've owned it for about a year. Um, I purchased this off uh, somebody that I'd known about 20 years ago. Um, just bumped into him on a, a Facebook group. He was putting it up for sale. Uh, one of my friends actually uh, twisted my arm to go and have a look at it. And yeah, I love it. So I love it and I hate it all in the same breath. Um, I remember him when I were a child. It didn't last very long there. So for it to stand the testament of time and still be here, um, I think uh, that says something about the uh, Russian toasters that it's probably made of. Um, uh, the car's probably not for everybody's taste. Um, you know, some people are a little purist. Uh, so I've tried to keep the car kind of period modified. Um, the wheels on it are Alicats, which tend to go on the Mark II Escorts, um, for, for those that didn't know. Um, the car didn't actually look like this when I bought it. Uh, I've put quite a lot of hours into it, but tried to keep it as original as I can. Um, drives well, no knocks, runs, starts, stops. Um, it is up for sale. So if anybody wants to give me a shout, um, just uh, contact me via my email address and uh, thanks very much. We've had a look around the outside. Now I wanted to talk to you about the inside because the car didn't massively move on from 1980 when it came out to 1993 when this car was first issued in the UK. So I thought I'd show you what we've got on display inside here. First of all, we've got our glove box just over here. It's really fiddly to get open, actually. I'm terrified I'm going to break it. Now, as we open up, you can see there we've got a first aid kit. 
in the center we've got our heater controls and here this button is actually the horn as i found out much to my surprise earlier let me show you I'm not going to show you that for too long i'm going to upset the starbucks staff now as we come down we've got our ashtray and we've got our cigar lighter to the right and a cassette player which I'm not sure if it's original, but it looks pretty original and it's very in keeping with the car. In fact, it's one of my pet hates when people rip stuff like this out and put CD players in. I hate it. Now, in front of us, everything is kind of... So over here, we've got rear screen. We've got heater on and off. Seem to have two speeds there. That's posh. Then we've got our lights to the right. Fog light as well got more than I thought we did and then we've got three dials in front of us so again these are very functional so we've got our miles per hour on there we have got our trip clock and we've got our general overall mileage which as you can see isn't that high which might explain why the car is so nice in the center there we can see if our battery's charging and over on the right we've got a split dial which i do like in a car actually so at the top we've got temperature gauge and below that we've got our fuel gauge as well now we can tell that fiat was involved in this somehow because these controls are just like the ones that we had on that fiat that we took out the fiat 127 so as you can see here at the back we've got the lights we've got the indicator and on the right hand side we've got our wipers which was all fun and games earlier because when I set off my indicators on my car are on this side and I accidentally flipped the wipers on well done although it's very spartan inside here and we don't have masses going on we have kind of got everything that we need now the other thing that I wanted to show you before we set off was the gearbox. So we come up, I'm just gonna put my foot on the clutch there. So you'll see there's not much travel actually between the gears, so that's first, down into second, across, into third, down into fourth, and come across into fifth. Now to get it into reverse, because I keep messing this up, we push this down and we bring it across and down. Needs quite a positive action there to get that into gear. Bring that up and we're back into neutral. Now remember that some of these would have had a four speed gearbox, but the reverse on both the four and the five speed gearbox are exactly the same. So we kind of walked through the dash for you there. So let's get the car started up so you can hear how she sounds. Now we don't have a choke on this, so to get it started, we do just have to put our foot down a little bit. Now this is what it sounds like inside the car. Now let me show you from the back as well. Now I'm gonna go up through the gearbox so you can hear what this sounds like. And with that there, we're up into fifth gear. Now I came into Lada with zero expectations, except that everybody I knew that owned one or had owned one said that they were a really good car. So coming into this test today, I expected to be really impressed because essentially it's a very cheap car. And when you hear people talk about them, they always go on about how reliable they are. And in fact, they're so reliable that when New Zealand bought them, they bought them exclusively to be taxis. So when everybody said to me, a lot is really reliable, I kind of expected that to be the truth. What I wasn't expecting was the turning circle, which is hideous, 
or the fact that you have to have arms of steel to drive one of these things because I think power steering would really, really help this, but currently with no power assisted steering at all, it's a really heavy car to drive. And that's the only thing that's really off-putting about this because the rest of the car is actually really pleasurable. It feels very well built, which is one of my big plus points for this. And the only thing that's slightly unnerving is when you drive the bonnet slightly flexes, which is very reminiscent of some of the 70s of cars I've taken out. And in fact, the Metro's bonnet does it as well. So you can see it slightly flexing when you drive, which is uh, always one of those things and you think, have I shut the bonnet properly? And it's the smaller details as well on this car that help make it a really usable daily classic. For example, those twin speed wipers, it may seem like a little thing, but when you're driving along and the rain is really bad or it's snowing, it means that it will just power you through and you're not being put out. The heat is pretty good too. Um, you know, it's no patch on something you'd get in a modern car, but it's good enough to get you through. And I think as well, it's quite an interesting car because even though they are Russia's most popular second-hand car, they weren't the biggest, biggest hit in the West because of course we had other low cost motoring options coming in at the time. We had Kia, Daewoo, Proton, those sorts of brands coming in that really competed for that budget space along with of course your metros and things like that. So there was a lot of stuff competing for that lower space which meant that even though they were relatively popular in the 80s, by the, well, the early 80s, by the 90s, it started to really fade out because that lower cost bracket space started to become saturated. However, they were still really popular in Eastern Europe. So whilst we don't see as many here, they're still really popular over there. Which kind of brings me on to the community. So a really interesting story is, is that um, Steve who owns this, his neighbor, Adam, also has a larder. And in fact, the community is so positive and so friendly that Adam made Larder friends on Instagram in Russia and went over to Russia and met these people and they welcomed him like they were family. And I think, so even if you've got that language barrier, it's really great that the Larder community, despite not speaking the same language, are all really, really supportive. Now cost wise, and in fact, it's probably worth mentioning at the point of this video, that this car is for sale. So this is like top whack money, but having a quick look through eBay and other for sale sites, um, you can get a larder pretty cheaply. And in fact, if you're willing to go to mainland Europe, you can get them even cheaper, which kind of makes it a classic that you could use and enjoy. And of course you can get all the parts for, and in fact, to me, it's kind of a win-win situation because it's got that cool 70s, 80s styling, but without that massive price bracket that you're getting on some of the VW stuff and even into your British Leyland stuff now, which is really going up massively in value. Now, of course, I spoke about the parts availability. It's all relatively cheap as well. So realistically, you could probably keep something like this on the road for a much lesser amount than you could keep something like a Mini or a Morris Minor on the road. And it seems to me that a lot of the parts that we're getting for some of our British classics are being produced at inferior quality. Whereas I've been told very reliably by a few people that the stuff that's being made for larder is of the same good quality that it was back in the day as it is now. Well, it has to be because people are still running these as their daily cars which is great because they're absolutely bonkers. Why wouldn't you run a larger every day? Now, if you haven't been put off by the heavy steering and you're still interested in a larder, I guess the only other very small detail to mention is, is it's not the quietest in the cabin, but really that doesn't put me off because of the age of the cars that I drive. So I drive stuff from the 70s. So this for me is an uncomfortably noisy, but if you're used to a modern car day to day, you might find this slightly agricultural. But for me, I don't think that's a massive problem. And as you can feel there, as we're going over the bumps, the suspension is pretty good too. And with that five speed box and that 1.5 engine, you're keeping up with traffic 
to a level that's quite comfortable as well and you're not having to rev the engine into high heaven to get it to keep up either so you know that extra noise for me is discounted by the fact that you're able to keep up with that traffic so we're coming to the end of the video and it's been a bit of a funny one because it's been really nice to take this car out. Um, I've never driven a larder before, even though I've been, uh, I've been trying to, uh, been trying to negotiate one for many, many months, and it's been a really fun and surprising experience because I came into this expecting it to be quite a sturdy vehicle, but I kind of thought it might be a little bit boring because it's that age when classic cars start to get a little bit boring, and in fact, it's been jolly good fun. So fun, in fact, that if you've got stronger arms than me and you're not so much of a wimp as I am, I would thoroughly recommend one. So if you're watching this and you're one of those people that emails me on a regular basis and says, Steph, I want an affordable classic, my recommendation to you after today is the Lada Riva. So I really hope you've enjoyed this video. It's been an absolute pleasure making it for you. Um, and it's been good fun taking this larder out. Thank you very much, Steve, for lending me your pride and joy. And uh, I've put Steve's details below. So if you are interested in buying this larder, uh, just give Steve an email. Now, until next time, take care and drive safely.